Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life, your one-stop true crime destination. We talk about all the cases out there, the crazy ones, the insane ones, the twisty ones, the cold ones, the unsolved ones. We literally talk about it all. So if you're brand new and stopping by for the first time, welcome to the channel. I hope you enjoy today's case video. And if you do, and if you feel like this is a channel you want to support and come back and watch some more videos, then hit that subscribe button below. That way you will get notified of new videos as I upload them and you will get notified if you turn on your notification bell, you'll get notified of live streams as they happen in real time because a lot of the time we're covering cases that are ongoing and that are happening in the moment. So I will pop on and live stream trials, hearings, verdicts, all of that stuff with you. So subscribe if you like the channel. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining me today. And as always, thank you guys so much for your support. The case we're talking about today, where do I begin? Um, gosh, where do I begin? Not only is it twisty and manipulative and horrible, but also the criminals are pretty stupid. And we have encountered quite a few cases where the criminals are not very bright, but this one might take the cake on that, guys. It really might. Just the selfishness and the stupidity behind it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to be very interested to hear your thoughts. So Shannon Matthews was just nine years old when she was reported as missing on February 19th, 2008. The search for Shannon became national news and people were desperate to find this little girl. Nobody knew where she was. Everybody came out in truckloads to help. But where was she? And who could have taken her? What could have happened? So let's get right into it. Tend to life with Annie Elise starts right now. Nine-year-old Shannon Matthews was the daughter of Leon Rose and Karen Matthews. Shannon was described by those who knew her as very quiet. She was a little bit timid. She played on her own most of the time with the exception of a couple of close friends, but really kind of just did everything by herself. Her parents split up when she was just a toddler and her dad, Leon, wasn't super involved in her life. She lived with her mom, Karen. Now her mom, Karen, had a total of seven children with five different fathers. Five of the children lived with Karen, Shannon's mother, and with Karen's boyfriend, Craig, who was 22 years old and 10 years younger than Karen. The mother, her children, and her boyfriend lived in one of the lower income areas of Dewsbury, West Yorkshire, and they were getting government housing. And some reports were saying that she was getting about 400 pounds a week in benefits, which is, you know, almost double in US dollars because of the exchange rate, but whatever. Karen wasn't working at all and was staying at home with the children, and the amount of benefits that she was collecting was essentially similar to what she would be making if she were working. And this is something that's actually very common, because once you take into account your salary and what that would be if you were working full-time or part-time or whatever it is, and then what the expense would be to have childcare while, and your children looked after while you're at work, a lot of the times it actually just makes more sense to be a stay-at-home mom because what you'd be earning versus your expense doesn't really net out. So this is a common thing. However, friends and family of Karen's have said that since each child essentially means more benefits, Karen was continuing to have more children just for the sake of getting those benefits something that also, unfortunately, is extremely common worldwide, not only with biological children, but also with fostering and even adoption in some states. Some people just, honestly, I hate the expression, but they use these children as meal tickets. But despite having all of these children, she wasn't really taking care of any of her children. During one of the major fights that Karen had with one of her ex-boyfriends, her friends actually ran into the house to get her daughter, Shannon, and take her out. And police ended up coming and the friends ended up saying, hey, we're going to keep Shannon with us until all of this turmoil and arguments die down and everything is settled. And when they did that, they discovered that Shannon's head was covered in lice and she was just completely filthy. Friends said that she was very shy, very skittish. She would flinch anytime there was any sort of movement or loud noises, just some very concerning behavior. These friends ended up calling social services because of this, and they called many times as they were worried about not only Shannon's safety, but the safety and the well-being of all of the kids. But to no avail, the kids were left in that unsafe environment with a filthy home and the neglect of their basic needs. 
So on February 19th, 2008, Shannon went to school and then she had swimming lessons, which were provided by the school, where they bus you to the lessons and then bus you back. She walked to school and her lessons, but this time, unlike her other times that she's gone, she never returned home at her usual time. Swim lessons ended at approximately 3.10 p.m., when she then was returned back to the school on the bus and released for the day. So when Karen got home that late afternoon, early evening, her boyfriend Craig told her that Shannon hadn't come home yet. So Karen went to the neighbor's house to tell them that Shannon hadn't come home. After going to her neighbors, though, she then called the school to ask if the bus had returned from the swimming lessons. And to me, that's the first red flag. Why would you go to your neighbor's house to chat about it before calling the school to see if the bus had returned? Unless it was to see if Shannon perhaps happened to go over to her neighbor's house by chance. It's just weird that your first call wouldn't be to the school, or even worse, to the police, I guess, unless you don't want to jump to conclusions. But there wasn't something. there's something that's not just really aligning for me there. So finally, after a while, at 6.50 p.m., which is pretty late in my opinion, Karen then decides that she's gonna call 999, which is the emergency number in the UK, similar to 911 here in the States. Police emergency. Hiya, I want the cotton blotter is missing, please. Right, how old is she? Nine. Nine? Yeah. When did you last see her? She went to school this morning. Right, have there been any arguments or any no, like not that? at all? No. Have, have you been in touch with any of her friends or anybody like that? Everywhere I can think of her from right. friends, wives, and family and everything. And nobody at all no. has any information on where she can be. No. Does she go to school and come back on her own? normally then. Yes. Right. So you were expecting her own what at four o'clock back? About half a seat later she's come right. back from school to me to work three. Does she have a mobile phone or anything like that? No, it's at home. Just right, so she there's no way of actually ringing to find no. out. But you've run round all the friends, yes. so you've been in touch with all the relatives yes. and there's nowhere else that you've got left to look. No. Have you been in touch with the school or uh, they can they confirm whether she went to a normal time at ten past three? Right. What the caller? Shannon Matthews. Has she been missing before? No, first time. And there's been nothing to, to, to intimate why she should go? No, no. So she waited over three hours to make this call. After learning that the bus had already returned and that Shannon wasn't at the school or with neighbors, why on earth wouldn't you call the police right away? So immediately, police began working and searching, and tons of people started coming out in droves over to the family's house to see how they could offer any sort of help. Some were even going out to search during the night in the dead of winter. Temperatures were below sub-zero, and it was so cold that it was actually a huge concern. Over 200 police members were involved in the search overnight, and everybody was looking for Shannon. Obviously, this type of stuff didn't happen often in this community, so everyone was absolutely shocked and wanted to help in any way. The next morning, news crews started becoming involved heavily after police put out a huge media push trying to get all eyes on this case. And by this point, they had also already gotten the homicide and major inquiry team involved. There were now over 300 members of law enforcement working on this case. Everyone was pretty convinced that Shannon had been abducted at this point, and they were working hard to get the word out about her everywhere they could. News, newspapers, TV, phone calls, search parties, everything. But in all of this, while everybody in the community and law enforcement seems to be chaotic trying to find this missing nine-year-old girl, in all of this, Karen was oddly calm, perhaps too calm. Two family liaison officers who were assigned to the case had the exact same thoughts on Karen's demeanor. She was very calm, very calm. Too, too calm for somebody whose daughter's gone missing. Um, bearing in mind, you know, the, the, the huge scale of the investigation that had been launched. I came into the investigation or, or as a family liaison officer later in, uh, in the, the first day after Alex had come back to the team saying that he'd got concerns and felt he needed a second opinion. And uh, myself and Alex went out to see Karen at the house. Karen shared this council house, now boarded up, with her boyfriend, Craig Meehan, and four of her seven children.
Many of us may have asked ourselves how we'd react if our child went missing. It's unlikely to be like this. I suppose one of the first things that hit me was the fact that Craig is on his Xbox concentrating on playing a, a game and, and Karen's just sat beside him and they seemed to be side by side, whatever they did, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Um, yeah, I suppose when we first came into the house it perhaps wasn't as untidy as it is now. Within the, f the first certainly five, ten minutes, my phone rang and I've got one of these dodgy tunes on it and Karen got up and started, oh, I love this tune. And, she, and start, she started dancing, dancing, didn't she, just in front of the telly. And I remember thinking, this is the first time I've met you and it, there's something just not quite right here. Now what's interesting is Karen and Craig started to actually get mad about the media. Karen was complaining that she was being compared to the Madeleine McCann family because people were saying that she wasn't making any sort of effort to find Shannon and that they want her to make a bigger effort and a bigger stink about it. Well, obviously, your child is missing. So sitting on your couch, taking photos, playing games, dancing around, doesn't make it seem like you're necessarily super concerned. And at one point during the search and this entire thing, Karen was even standing in her living room, just moving the curtains back and forth. And news crews were outside, obviously streaming her house at the time. So she was watching her curtains move on live TV, just like as they're streaming her house, she's moving the curtains and she's just watching herself. Who even does that? period, but who would do that when your child is missing? Guys, let's just start waving it. And not only all of that, but Shannon went missing without a trace, which is very similar to the Madeline McCann case, and that had broken less than a year prior at the time. So, of course, people would be comparing the two cases. There were a lot of similarities. And not to mention all of that, but why on earth would you ever complain about the media and their presence in this? Wouldn't you want every single person on the planet talking about this case, searching for your daughter, so um, I don't know that you could be reunited with your daughter? Finally, a couple of days later, on the night of the 20th, Karen decides to plea for Shannon to come home. Shannon, if you're out there, please, darling, come home. I love you so much, me and your dad and your brothers. Your sisters, everybody loves you. Your dad's missing you so much, Shannon. He's even out looking for you. Please come home, Shannon. If you're out there, come home. If anybody's got my daughter, my beautiful princess daughter, please bring her home safe. I please. need her home. So again, by this point, everyone was convinced that Shannon had been kidnapped. Kids weren't playing outside. Parents were driving kids to school and not let, allowing them to walk to or from school, and the general fear was that another child was going to be kidnapped. Every single house that was on Shannon's route home was being searched by police, was being searched by dogs, and this again just goes to show how invested law enforcement and the community, actually, really were in finding Shannon. There was no stone unturned. People in the area were also donating money for a fund and businesses were offering things to her family in efforts to help ease the burden that they were facing. And the reward fund got up to 50,000 pounds. Again, it's almost double the amount if you're calculating US dollars. One of the local supermarkets even offered them free groceries. But here's what's weird. Karen and her boyfriend Craig filled one of the grocery carts with food and another with alcohol. I'm sorry, you have several kids to feed and you are filling a cart with alcohol. More red flags, guys. Karen did her first official interview on February 22nd. Just not like, you know, you used to be, it just feels egg, you know, and I'll just be that way. It's, it's not like Shannon, which it's not. She's timid, she's scared of dark and everything. So that's how I know it. So something's wrong. She's out there somewhere in a nice warm environment. The person who's got her is not coming forward, which that's what we'd like, really. After 45 minutes of questioning, Karen kept up her appearance as an anguished mum. Could this really be an act? She's just a princess, that's all I can say. She's just not like it up to a little while. It's just not. Where could she be? It's a little thing where.
that same day, Leon, Shannon's biological father, said that Shannon had actually talked to him and confided in him about wanting to live with him. As all of this is happening, police were in and out of this family home. They were talking to family, they were searching, they were doing everything. And during one of their talks, a police officer had decided to start walking around the house as they were looking. And this was very early into this search. So when they go into Shannon's room, the officer saw the words, I want to live with my dad, written on her wall next to her bunk bed. For a while, people wondered if Shannon had run away due to this note, that she was unhappy at home and she decided to run away and that's how she went missing and she truly wasn't kidnapped. But her father, Leon, said that that was unlike Shannon and that she had good relationships and he does not think that she would have run away. So family and friends started getting suspicious, especially after seeing that outcry, essentially, written on her wall next to her bed. One of the family friends also mentions becoming suspicious due to Karen being so sure, so positive, that Shannon would come home. Now remember in the interview, Karen was saying that Shannon was out there in a nice, warm environment, almost like a little clue as to where Shannon really was, almost as though she wasn't concerned because maybe she knew that Shannon was safe. That day, CCTV footage was released of Shannon leaving the swim center, and this was the last footage of Shannon before her disappearance. This CCTV showed Shannon on a class trip to the swimming baths on the afternoon she disappeared. It was the last solid evidence the police had. We had no witnesses to suggest that Shannon had been placed in the car. We had no witnesses saying that Shannon's been taken into a particular house. We had no idea where or how Shannon had been taken on that particular afternoon. So a week goes by with nothing. Many tips were called in for possible sightings, but nothing checked out. And now at this point, Karen is continuing to do interviews. And this one is particularly interesting. I mean, do you believe the answer lies locally, that, that somebody knows something? What, what, do you, what do you feel? Well, I think that somebody out there will know Shannon supposed to probably know me as well. And it's just, I just want her home safe, really. So again, it seems like maybe she was subtly dropping some hints, but she was also smirking when she was saying all of that. Now, who would be smirking and talking so nonchalantly about their child being missing if they weren't involved somehow in some way? I've said it before, interviews with parents always speak volumes, in my opinion. Not only what they say, but their mannerisms and their behavior. It, to me at least, always tells the story of if they're innocent, or if there is something that should be investigated further. And I know that oftentimes people can, you know, there's not a foolproof method to reading people, but, and I know people can trick the system sometimes, but generally when you see these initial interviews from family members, loved ones, parents, when people go missing, there's usually a sense you can, you can get as far as if they should be looked into further or if they're truly innocent. And a perfect example is the Trezell and Jackie West interview. I mean, red flags were waving all over that interview. The Chris Watts interview as well. I mean, quite a few of them where you're like, uh, that doesn't seem necessarily like the expected behavior we would see from a parent who has a missing child. And this interview also was the same in my opinion. A little girl named Megan Aldride was Shannon's best friend, and she gave a heartbreaking interview about missing her best friend, saying, I sat on the bench at school today on my own at break time because I had no one to play with. Shannon's chair at school is empty and I've got no one to sit next to now. I just want her back. She was the bestest friend in the world. I liked everything about her. She was kind, and if I wanted to play with a toy that she was playing with, she'd let me join in. She made me laugh and we'd talk about our brat stalls because we really love them. Truly just like a sweet, innocent little girl and she's saying she's my bestest friend, I have nobody to play with, I have nobody to sit with, it just breaks my heart. So police were continuing to interview little Megan, Shannon's best friend, to try to gather possible information and she ends up telling them that Shannon was being bullied the day before her disappearance while they were on the bus. She says that Shannon was kicked and called a fatty and ugly. Kids are just seriously so, so cruel. But Megan stood up for Shannon, and Megan told the girl to stop or that she was going to tell the teacher. Shannon was, of course, very emotional about this because what nine-year-old little girl wouldn't be? She already had so much going on at home, and now she has to deal with this at the school too? 
So Megan also tells police that Shannon has a foxhole that she actually likes to hide in, saying it was behind a bush near the railroad tracks and that Shannon would often go and retreat in a little secret hiding spot there. So the police have Megan show them where the foxhole is and take them there but unfortunately she couldn't find it. Her memory just wasn't as sharp as they had hoped it was. So the search is continuing now, and by now 16 victim recovery dogs out of UK's 27 recovery dogs are working this case. It's clear that they believe it's now a recovery case and law enforcement is working day and night. And Shannon's mom's boyfriend, Craig, also gives an interview. And in this interview, he denies he had anything to do with Shannon's disappearance, which feels very, very odd. For the first time since Shannon Matthews went missing, her mother summons up the strength to go back into the schoolgirl's bedroom. It's just as Shannon left it almost three weeks ago. Not the last time I went in there, I got trusty man to get up for school. And why have you not been back in there since? Because I can't do it. But it's not only like being there, but not being there. Then she's out there somewhere and not here where she belongs. No matter what they're going through, life has to go on. There are three other children at home and their schooling remains a priority. The youngest have been told that Shannon is on holiday, but the pretense is hard to keep up. Particularly with allegations emerging in the newspapers that Shannon's stepfather, Craig, hit her hard enough to leave bruises. Let me ask you directly, have you ever hurt a child? Would no. you ever consider hurting a child? No. Did, did you, were you ever cruel to her? No. There's even a lot of people that could back that up. There's a lot of my friends and family around here. They even trust me with their kids. I look after my babes we play, don't we? Same with our Courtney. I would never hurt anyone, basically. Karen Matthews insists that Shannon was happy and settled at home, despite claims to the contrary from some members of her own family. On Thursday, March 13th, law enforcement started getting information from a family member about a man named Michael Donovan. And Michael was the uncle to Shannon's mom's boyfriend, Craig. He was Craig's uncle, and he lived about a mile from Shannon's house. They said that the family hadn't really heard from Michael since Shannon went missing. And ironically, Karen had left Michael off of the family tree that she gave to law enforcement. By that point, nearly 200 people had been interviewed, most of them being Shannon's extended family and families of the men that Karen had been with in the past. So if all of these people had been interviewed and talked to, why hadn't Michael been? He was clearly close to the family. They also had searched over 1,700 houses and taken over 1,000 statements. So why was Michael left off that list and not included, unless it was done intentionally? The next day, law enforcement decides that they're going to turn their focus on to Craig's uncle Michael and see what the heck is going on here. And when they were tracing his steps, they found that 15 months prior, Michael had actually abducted his own daughter from school while she was in foster care at the time. His two daughters were in foster care after allegations were made that he made them watch him as he had sex with two escorts. Guys, I mean, the things that some parents and people get off on is just truly appalling. I wish I could say this was the first time I heard something like this. It's awful. So the police, of course, decide to go and visit Michael's house and look into him a bit more. But Michael refused to answer the door, despite his neighbor saying that they were positive that he was home. One neighbor even said that she had heard what sounded like tiny feet walking above her place. Now this set off alarms for police, so they called for backup and they decided they were going to enter this home. So as they were walking around the house, an officer heard a little voice say, stop it, you're frightening me now. And the officer said, although I knew I had heard her, I didn't know where she was. And then I became aware of movement within the bed. As he went across the far side of the bed, Shannon's little head appeared from the side of the bed from underneath. So he says that he reached over, picked Shannon up and carried her out. He says, I couldn't believe that I found her and that I found her alive. He says, we had Shannon and she was alive. I just couldn't believe it. So he carried her right out and asked her where Michael was. 
and Shannon tells him that he was also under the bed. So they went in and they got Michael, which was a big struggle. During the struggle, he actually bit an officer, bit an officer, and he yelled, get Karen down here. We had a plan. We're sharing the money, the 50,000 pounds. He shouted this. Boom. There it was. That was where the motivation was for this entire thing. A staged kidnapping to reap the reward money. Michael outed both of them immediately. And this was all a ploy for money and for attention. So officers continue their investigation and they are searching Michael's house. They found a rope tied to the bed, which is obviously very unsettling. And this rope was used to tie Shannon to the bed. They also saw the room where she was held. This entire house, guys, was absolutely filthy. And as if this wasn't weird and strange enough, there was a list of rules that Shannon had to follow. You must not make any noise or bang your feet. You must not go near the windows. You must not get anything or do anything without me here. Keep the TV volume low. Then saying, you can play Super Mario, some DVDs, and some music. The IPU on the bottom of the rules stood for I promise you. But what were they promising her? Or was this something that she had to sign as a promise to them? So Shannon was being routinely tied up. She was tied around her waist so that she could still go to the bathroom, but she was unable to leave the house. There was also a noose hanging down in the hallway, but there was no evidence that it was ever used. But who even has that? Was it this there to intimidate her? Was it there to scare her? Who has a noose just hanging in their hallway? Finally, on top of one of the cabinets was a newspaper article discussing that 50,000 pound reward. Meanwhile, as the search is underway, Michael was back at the station and he was being interviewed. He tells police to go and arrest Karen. Then, as Donovan was booked in, another revelation. Yes, you want to arrest Karen? Michael. What do you mean? When you were arrested in the back of the van, you made some comments to me after you were cautioned. All right, I'm going to say those things to you now in front of all these officers here and also under camera. I want you just to agree with if you've said this or not, okay? This is at 13.34 today, all right? You've said, get Karen down here, we've got a plan. We'll share the money, 50,000 pounds. She said I was to keep Shannon and look after her and she, Karen, would report her missing. I said, what do I do then? She said, you'll take her back to your place and keep her there until I phone you. I said I wasn't happy about this and she then threatened, if I didn't do it, to get three lads onto me. Michael Donovan's three-page statement was read to detectives by his solicitor. And I was frightened that if I didn't do it, they would come after me. I said, OK, I'll do it. And she said there was money for me in it. I said I didn't want the money. She told me just to do what she said. She said if I told anyone or I went to anyone, I would be dead. So apparently the plan was to release Shannon into a public market and then find her and collect the reward money which feels like such a bootleg stupid plan because if the person who ends up finding a missing person after almost a month and after all of these law enforcement officials have been searching, these huge search parties, the 200 plus people, the dogs, everything, if the person who ends up finding her happens to be related to close members of the victim, wouldn't that throw off a red flag? Don't you think that they would investigate you a little bit after you reported finding her before kicking you over the reward money? It just does not seem to me like a very thought out plan. Not at all. So Michael was charged with kidnapping, with false imprisonment, and perverting the course of justice. They also brought in Karen for questioning, but of course, she denied having any part of this sick and twisted fake abduction. Listen, Karen, I know you're upset, and we need to be able to establish exactly what's going on. And you are aware that Michael is, in part, holding you partly responsible. So I think the best thing we can do is so that we're all clear about this, is tell you what Michael's saying 
and he was like, I need to come, I want the opinion to know that David go away and live to know, never speak to him about anything about abducting someone at all. It was just a normal day for us that she went to school and come over to school that way. But not long later, just a few days later, things took an even more shocking turn. And Karen's boyfriend, Craig, was actually arrested on April 2nd on 11 counts of child P. He had 49 pictures in his possession with victims as young as four years old. He had been downloading it and saving it to his tech. And he was convicted. But he was only sentenced to 20 weeks, guys. 20 weeks. A few days later, on Sunday, April 6th, Karen was arrested. And on the way to the station, she tells them that she knew where Shannon was all along. But then she starts making up all of these new excuses. So if she knew where Shannon was, why didn't she just tell them? And she does another interview a couple days later, and she says that they came up with the plan the day before Shannon was abducted or went missing. So if she was sending Shannon off, why didn't she send the rest of the kids? Why Shannon? Clearly, she wasn't trying to get away from her boyfriend. She was after the money in all of this, obviously. So, what I mean, why did you phone the police when you knew where she was? They don't suspect anything. And how would, by phoning the police, people not suspect you? What did you hope to achieve by that? What do you mean by that? Well, you said I'd, I'd phone the police so nobody would suspect anything. What What do you mean? I think so Craig didn't suspect me doing what, I was, what we were doing, which was Shannon, I think leaving him and stuff. So this again was part of your act, to make it look like you were genuinely missing? Yeah when you really knew that she wasn't genuinely missing. Is that right? Yeah. So then the police have come to your house, have they? Yeah. And, and what have you told the police? I've told them what she was wearing and stuff like that. Did you tell them where she was? No. Well, why not? In front of everybody and everybody else. Have got me for it? Yeah. Why didn't you tell them? Well, I think the answer in the question is it? What why she said. So why didn't you tell the police where, where she was at that time? Because I didn't exactly know where she was. There's no sure we living somewhere, but I didn't know where. Karen was officially charged with perverting the course of justice, kidnapping, and false imprisonment. And then she had a third interview, where, once again, she began denying any sort of involvement in this. Just get your stories straight, Karen. Going down all the change of yeah. story again. Yeah. Right? It's changing it. Well, yesterday and today, earlier on, you've said you met. Make none of them the day before, and you've arranged for him to pick up Shannon from school. You've told us either on Mo uh, Moorside Avenue or on School Lane. Haven't you? Pardon? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's get this straight. I'm not going to have any more of these stories again. Is that, that is a is fact. That, is that right? You yeah. asked him. Asked him to look after her. Are you sure of that? Yeah. Right, thank you. Right, right. Let's get it from from there. What happened then? I just went off pear shape. It didn't go to plan the way I wanted it to plan. Mm. Go to plan. What is your plan? Why did you want it to go to plan? Me told Craig it would over to leave him. It was then found out that this went even deeper than what they thought. Police initially had thought that this was, you know, a month-long situation. She was held in captivity. That it didn't go beyond that, but... 
that's not what the truth was at all. Because after Shannon was rescued, a drug sample was done, and she tested positive for several drugs. She tested positive for temazepam and meclizine, and temazepam is a strong sleeping aid, and meclizine, and I hope I'm saying that right, me yeah, meclizine, it's um, a motion sickness medication, kind of like Dramamine, where it gives you drows drowsiness as one of the main side effects. In addition to those, she tested positive for amitriptyline, which is an antidepressant, tramadol, which is a pain medication, and dihydrocodine, which is another painkiller. Now, I probably butchered the names of all of those medications, but just like, give me a break, guys. So they were drugging this poor child so that she couldn't do whatever they didn't want her to do, either leave or make noises, or, or they wanted to subdue her and maybe perhaps ultimately make her unaware of what was happening if some of that child pee that Craig was arrested for was also, you know, rolled into the situation with his uncle because we know his uncle before had made his two daughters watch him have sex with escorts. I mean, I, I think that this might run a little bit deeper. And the hair follicle test that tested for the drug use tested for over a 20-month period. And this showed that Shannon had been drugged with a couple of those things very heavily even prior to her abduction. So why was her mother medicating her so much even before this whole fake kidnapping scheme? Further CCTV footage showed Michael, the uncle, visiting a chemist multiple times during the time that Shannon was missing. Karen and Michael both went to trial in December of that year, and Shannon's own mother testified against her, saying, this is a staged performance, isn't it? You play to the cameras and you play to the court, don't you? You're an accomplished liar, aren't you? I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? The trial mostly went through everything that we've already talked about, plus they discussed how there was over three and a half million pounds used in this search and how all of that money could have gone towards something else. Just a complete waste of money. So both Michael and Karen were found guilty and they were sentenced to eight years each, but they actually both got out at the four-year mark on good behavior. Not fair at all. During prison, Karen claimed that she had found God, and she also started taking, get this, parenting classes. And she says that she took these classes in case she were going to have more children. Please, God, don't do not have any more kids. She also allegedly wrote dirty letters to people for extra money. She, this lady is like a character. She then told a news station that the only things that she missed while being in prison were sex and shopping. There was zero mention of any of her kids. This lady is honestly a real piece of work, like the ultimate, ultimate Karen, literally. She was often attacked multiple times by people in prison, and she often had black eyes when her friend would come and visit her. And truthfully, guys, I can't say that I'm mad about that. So after she was released, she moved to the other side of the county, and she moved under a new name. But then she ended up changing her name back, saying that she couldn't get a job, she was complaining about how much she was being given in benefits. Here we go again, comes back to money once again. And then she said, I am not Britain's worst mom. I didn't kill anybody. Um, you may not have killed anybody, but you sure didn't care about your daughter, and you not only staged her abduction and made her stay for a month in this house with this stranger tied to it with a rope and God knows what may have happened in there, but you also wasted three and a half million pounds of your country's money on wasted resources for a child that was never missing to begin with. Not to mention you made it that much harder for real children who are missing to get the resources and the search parties that your child received. So fast forward to 2018, and in 2018, it seemed like Karen's money prayers had been answered because she reportedly got herself a sugar daddy. They apparently worked alongside each other at this charity store, and when questioned about their relationship, this guy says, it's my Christian duty to explain what love is about. She has concerns. She is a person of need, and whatever that need is, if people cross my path, I will care and support. Okay, guy. Okay, good luck, good luck. Now, that relationship didn't last. Big shocker there. And then in 2019, she got engaged to somebody else who was actually a child chomo, but they separated just after six weeks. And again, the fact that she was engaged to a chomo, look it up if you don't know what that means, 
and there were allegations of similar activity with her previous boyfriend Craig, his uncle Michael. That's what leads me to believe, and we know she was like putting medication in her daughter before this abduction. All of these things are leading me to believe that there was something a little bit more deeply rooted here. So we know what Karen's up to or what she's been up to in the last few years, but still nobody knows anything about what happened to good old Uncle Mike, Michael Donovan. Nobody knows where he might be. However, Craig has moved many times. He moves every single time his identity is found out because people obviously become outraged that he's anywhere near them in the community. And when they become outraged, he's actually been assaulted numerous times, leading him to move. And nobody knows where he is at this current moment in time. Now, as for all of the children, they aren't allowed to be contacted by Karen or Michael. And Shannon and her siblings' identities have all been changed. No one has heard from any of them, including Shannon's best friend, Megan, who is still absolutely heartbroken over losing Shannon. I'm curious to know what you guys think about this case. Was it all for the money? Were they really just trying to reap the benefits of that reward? Was there something a little deeper here? With the common thread of the chomo, the SA, all of the, the sex with escorts, all of these things, was there something deeper here? And why Shannon? Out of all of her kids, why Shannon? I, I'm just curious about that. But even more than that, what do you guys think about the sentencing? Because they got out in just four years for not only this crime and traumatizing her daughter and the rest of her family, but like the waste of money, resources. It just hardly feels like justice at all. So I'm curious to know your thoughts. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Again, this is just a case where I feel like the people involved, Shannon's mom, the boyfriend, even the uncle, are just like completely stupid. The plan wasn't thought out. It wasn't a well-formulated plan. It was selfish. It was like, honestly, it was actually pretty evil to do that to your daughter just for money. But then it's like all of the after effects, all of the aftershocks of this case with her saying she wanted plastic surgery, with then Craig being arrested, then she said she did do it. Then she said she didn't. Like all of these things, it was. it's just bizarre. It's bizarro. So I'm interested to know what you guys think. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coverage. Don't forget, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up on your way out. Subscribe if you haven't done so already so that you can stay updated of new case videos as I post them. All right, guys, thanks for joining me today. It was great hanging out with you. And until the next case, stay safe.